uh, walk it down the, the line for you. A um, couple of things that we have that I think are pretty interesting. What does this remind you of? That many of you used every day in high school and may even may even still be using. What does it look like? Backpack? It's it's basically it's 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 their version of a backpack, but it's a haversack is the term they use for it. And it is their basically their life is in this. And this is a postcard I borrowed from uh, the library. And later on you might want to come up and get a closer look at it, but this tells me everything that's supposed to go in that little small uh, knapsack. So you have things like a blanket, a poncho. You have one suit of underwear, and when they say underwear, they don't mean tight whities guys. They mean basically a union suit, so it's a one-piece undergarment, top and bottom, uh, a pair of socks, uh, a mess kit, a soap, um, extra socks, and a towel, and that's pretty much it. That is your life, is in this haversack. Now, a common phrase is, is that war is hell. What do you think happened to the soldier who was wearing this helmet? probably died, didn't he? Um, this was picked up off of a battlefield in France, um, the Little Wood, and it was the first major conflict that Americans fought in. Um, so this kind of shows you what can happen. Now here's another helmet. Why do you think, what is different about the two helmets? than if you're in something like this. Um, basically, the point is not to be shot. Have you heard the ter term trench warfare before? Are you all familiar? What's trench warfare? Anybody? Somebody? You dig a hole in the ground. Right. You basically, it's, it's, it's large ditches and you're hiding behind it and basically a good part of the time you're just sticking your head up and then occasionally everybody goes over the top. It was very, 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 very dangerous. This might be something that you might carry. This is what's called a trench knife and it's a model 1917. And when you look at this, it's not quite the same thing as a bayonet. What is different about this? Look at the blade. What's different about it? It's triangular, and then look what they've done to the handle here. So it's basically you've got knuckles. This is, why would you want something like this? Why do you think? It's stabbing and close in fighting, isn't it? Um, it's very, it's vicious. It's absolutely vicious. Um, I brought this over this morning and I can't actually pull it out of the canister because I think it's probably been in here for a hundred years, but this is a gas mask. What would be the function of a gas mask? I mean, what was going on in World War I? What was different about World War I than previous wars? I'm sorry? Chemical warfare. Um, the level of combat changed a lot, um, and so you had to worry about what you breathe. Um, we don't have a lot of armaments, but we do have uh, some examples like, and this is definitely not loaded, but this is a Springfield rifle, and this is the sort of thing, ladies and gentlemen, that your standard infantry troops would have carried. Um, they, they made hundreds of thousands
Now, other things that we have associated with World War I in the museum collection is this little um, item. Now, one of the uh, nicknames for this is a housewife. Why would something like this, what could this contain that it might be nicknamed a housewife? What would a housewife do for a man? I'm sorry? But then clean them, what else? It's a sewing kit, but they gave it the nickname a housewife, and that's an old term. That goes back at least to the Civil War. But this housewife has a couple of little <coughs> extra additions. Um, that po poison bullet um, uh, little statement that Jonathan pulled out, that actually came out of here. It also has a pledge in which it says, I solemnly promise God helping me to abstain from all intoxicating liquors as a beverage. And then it has a couple of uh, Bible verses on here. Why do you think intoxicating liquors was a problem? What did Jonathan say about what the nature of serving in the military was like? It was hurry up and wait, which meant they had a lot of downtime, which meant you could get into a lot of trouble, and drinking was one of those ways you could get into a lot of trouble. It does have your standard, like, needle and thread and buttons as well. Anybody serve in the military in the group today? Okay, well, this is what the dog tag looked like during World War I, and it's pretty, pretty basic. Uh, this happens to be Victor Strong's. Uh, dog tag. It does have his rank, and that's all. Uh, a lot of times they tell you very little. Dog tags today give you a lot more information. They might, they'll have your serial number. They'll also quite often have your religion. Why do you think that was important to have your religion on a dog tag today? Why do they do that? To bury so that you get the right burial customs and, and uh, the right religious services. Now this is, is basically an item that was done after the war. And this is basically a commemorative vase that someone in Germany has commissioned for their son who was killed apparently in the war. Um, and so the Germans have their own customs on that type of thing. Um, here we have a photograph of a doughboy. People did a lot of that. What do you think the function of this is? It's a shaving mirror. Now one of the interesting things about this mirror is it was made by a company, and I can tell because it's stamped in the mirror, it's Defiance Check Writing Corporation, Rochester, New York. I looked up this company and it did things like helping you um, run a business. It has nothing to do with basically personal use of a mirror. But apparently, it was wartime, they saw an opportunity, they took it. Uh, other things that we have, how might people at home support the war? What might people do? How do people support, uh, how do people show support today for troops? What do they do? raise money, um, help fundraisers. During World War I, they basically raised a lot of money by selling things like they called Liberty Bonds. You could buy what they called a Liberty Bond. And then when you bought one, you could wear a pin. And I'm just going to pass these around. The Red Cross was also very active as a fundraiser. And imagine what it was like. Think of the social pressure. If you're the only person on your street who is not wearing his pin to show that you support the Red Cross, you brought a Liberty Bond, etc. So a lot of a lot of social peer pressure then. Um, you can look at uniforms. You've, you're all familiar with them, but quite often uniforms give you clues about who is serving and the unit they're in. 
this is a little garrison camp and the emblem on here is what's called a caduceus. It's a medical symbol, so that tells us that the person who wore that was assigned to a medical unit. And then I've got down here, I've got these two banners. One is homemade, and one is manufactured. And these may actually date more from World War II than World War I, but I want to talk about them now because um, they got their start during World War I. Has anybody heard the term Gold Star Family or Gold Star Mother? Is that a term you're familiar with? Okay, what is it? Family or Correct. Correct. And so what would happen is they would hang these banners in your window and initially to start out with they would be blue stars. If you look over on that side of the room you see that poster there with five blue stars on it. Um, that is a poster to commemorate um, and it's propaganda value. It's to promote support of the war of um, these are the Sullivan brothers. They were five brothers from Iowa, Waterloo, Iowa. And initially in World War II, you could sign up and serve on the same, you could request to serve on the same ship or in the same unit as family members. What happened is, is their ship was torpedoed, the whole thing went down, and they became very, very famous as the loss of that family. Anybody seen the movie Saving Private Ryan? Okay, basically that, that movie takes the idea of the Sullivan brothers the plot is, is that they want to prevent another Sullivan Brothers PR disaster. So that's kind of the framework of that movie. Um, and, and again, to show that history is relevant, um, you know, not to get too deep in the woods of politics, but the whole issue of Gold Star families came up in the last presidential campaign. So history continues on and on and on. Um, other things that we have, uh, again, just more uniforms. Here somebody has actually made a soldier out of a doll and sewn actually sewn a little soldier suit for it. So again, support for the war. And I think that's basically what I've got for World War I. So we're going to turn you back and let you get up and go to the other side of the room now talk about uh, World War II related items in the museum collection. And how far have you gotten in your class at this point? Are you, uh, where, where are you at? What have you covered related to World War II? Are you fighting it yet? Okay. Has, so has war started yet? Okay. What this is, this is basically a knitting bag and it has on the side of it printed um, screen printed, bundles for Britain, and you might think, what on earth is bundles for Britain? But this actually is really exciting because it shows how America supported Great Britain during its entrance early in the war, before the United States actually entered the war. Uh, when, uh, do you know when the, the, the um, basically the Germans started bombing London, the Blitz? Do you know what year that was? Okay, that was in 39, and when did the U.S. go to war? When did we declare war? I thought I, thought I heard somebody say it. When was Pearl Harbor? 41. So there's a period of time there between September, I believe it was September of 39, basically, through December of 41. And Britain was kind of, and France fell pretty quickly. So Britain was kind of on its own. Now what is what is Great Britain? What kind of country is it? It's an island, isn't it? Which means that it has to import a lot of its goods and services in order to survive because it can't generally can't produce enough to feed its people. What this Bundles for Britain project was is a New York socialite responded to a plea from the British War Relief Society and I believe it was 1940 for assistance. And, um, you know, she was a wealthy lady, but she basically organized a knitting project because that was one of the things that the British War Relief Society said they needed. They needed things as simple as knitted socks. 
I mean, that's how basic it got. And so they started this organization project, and pretty soon other chapters would spring up around the country. And by the time it was um, basically had folded um, in about 1944, there were over 1, 1 million, 1.2 million Americans participating in this Bundles for Britain program. And that was just kind of an organizing agency because they did send other things other than knitted socks and knitted goods. But it kind of gives you an idea of the scope. And this bag was actually used by a woman here in Bowling Green, um, uh, the mother-in-law of one of our uh, former uh, staff members. Okay, so we're, we're getting into war in 19, um, December of 1941. When you all decide that you need to make a grocery run, what do you need to take with you? Money or plastic, right? And maybe a list. But if you have money or you know room on your card, you can pretty much buy anything you want, can't you? There's no limitation. Other than alcohol if you're not, you know, 21 or older. What this is, this is a war um, a ration book. And this ration book contains tokens, and these tokens help determine what you can buy. Because you would be issued a book, and it would have stamps and different things in it. And basically, it wasn't supposed to matter how wealthy you are, how connected you were. You were only supposed to get so much. And they rationed different types of goods and, and services. Let me see if I can find it. Um, the earliest thing they started rationing was tires in January of 42. So rubber was a big problem. Um, why was rubber a big problem? Because the Japanese had taken over the rubber plantations in, in Asia, and that means rubber was a difficult commodity. So they would ration things like cars, stoves, shoes, sugar, coffee, processed foods, <coughs> meats, and canned fish. They even rationed typewriters, supposedly, between 1942 and 1944. Now, who would get gasoline? If you had a job in a wartime industry that you needed to get to, you'd be likely to be allowed some gasoline, wouldn't you, if you had to drive? But if maybe you were a little old retiree here in Bowling Green living in town, they probably didn't see a need for you to get much gasoline. So you wouldn't be issued some of these stamps. Other things that they encourage, and as you look around the room, there's like the plant, a victory garden poster. I'll carry mine too. That has to deal with the, the rationing of rubber for tires. Um, Americans were planting victory gardens. They were raising, they were cutting back. This is a publication called Make and Men for Victory. And when you look at this, what strikes you about the cover? Red, white, blue, it's patriotism. Um, and it basically is a, a book for women. So you've got alterations. It talks about makes makeovers, mending and darning, accessories. If I open up the cover, it has the consumer's victory pledge in here. As a consumer in the total defense of democracy, I will do my part to make my home, my community, my country ready, efficient, and strong. I will buy carefully. I will take good care of the things I have. I will waste nothing. Now, do we follow these? of guidelines even though we are at war. Does, that, does anybody really follow these guidelines today? Do we think about these things? Anybody? We generally, we don't. It was a whole different mindset back then. Um, one of the mindsets for women, for example, was how to make over a man's suit so you could wear it as a woman. And one of the things that you see with women's clothing, it gets more mannish during the war. It gets it gets a little more masculine. Partially that's because a lot of women were joining the military. They were going into service. We had great, great need for that. Um, this was worn by a woman from Green Bay, Wisconsin, named Edna Violet. And she came to 
Bowling Green in 1942, and she is one of the passes around, and she ran a recruiting office on Main Street. And part of her duties, she worked six days a week, going to 25 counties, trying to recruit women to help in the war effort. Um, one of the little oddities about this, I read that these uniforms generally were produced under government contract, and they generally didn't always fit women quite right because they were used to making uniforms for men, and, and women were different. So most women, if they could, they actually would take their uniforms to a tailor to have them altered, and I've got a tailor's label from Cincinnati in this suit, in this uniform, so she probably did that. Here is another example of what a woman in service would do. Uh, she enlisted in the waves. Can anybody tell me what the waves are? Basically, it's the naval version. This was the WAX, Women's Army Corps, and this was the waves, which has to do with the Navy. She was a nurse. She was from Danville. She had spent three years studying at UK to be a medical technician, and then she enlisted, and they sent her up to New York City. Now imagine this little girl from Danville, Kentucky, going to New York City. It must have been the time of her life. She did her boot camp there for six weeks. She spent another three weeks assigned to a base nearby, and then they shipped her down to North Carolina, as I recall. Now one of the things that I find happen is, is that one of the things that many people save, men save in particular, are their military uniforms. Why do you think that is? What would be important in World War II, or World War I about your military service? If you were a, a, a say a, a man from Bowling Green, or Franklin, or uh, Glasgow. Probably your military service might be the first time that you really got away from home. It was a way that you got out and you really did you really did see the world. Now other things we have, we have correspondence, stationery. And this is kind of humorous stationery. Um, it's called this is this is your army stationery kit. But these sheets of paper actually are printed with things like um, Hey Woodman, spare this tree, it's me, so he's camouflaged. Gee, it's raining, I'm glad I brought my parachute. So these are kind of humorous. Now these are envelopes for female. If you were a serviceman overseas, this is what you would write your letters home on. And they have very explicit instructions about how to do it. And then ultimately, quite often, it's actually microfilm and your loved ones would actually get a very small piece of paper. Now other things we have are, what do you think this might be for? Any idea? It's not a shaving mirror. It's a signaling mirror. If you were shot down, you might want to basically be able to signal for a rescue. And on the back of it, it actually has instructions on how to do that. Other things that we have, uh, just little uh, minor things you could buy, like your soap dishes. These are cards that actually have pictures of airplanes. Why do they want to be able to identify an airplane? Cut. What could be important about that? Anybody? I think I heard somebody say, basically, you want to know if it's enemy aircraft coming in, don't you? Um, this is a Luftwaffe helmet, the type of souvenirs that people would often, um, soldiers would bring home. On this table, I've got a number of different souvenirs. This, for anybody who's into weaponry, this is a Japanese rifle called an Arasaka. It's a full service we bring home things like Nazi armbands. This is a belt buckle for the Hitler youth. Basically, it was sort of their version of the Boy Scouts only meant to provoke Nazi um, ideology. 
Uh, if you're a serviceman and you're in Paris uh, towards the end of the war after Paris has been free, you might bring home um, this little souvenir handkerchief from France to give to your loved one. Uh, here we have a Luftwaffe officer sword. Again, another common type of thing. Um, I will tell you that most of the time when people bring in these things, they always tell me they were picked up off of a dead <coughs> German. It, they never take it off of a live uh, soldier. It's always off of a dead soldier. Um, it's a, a tricky, tricky subject. Here is an artillery shell that has been modified. And he's had it engraved with Holland and Germany, uh, England and France. And he was apparently there between 1944 and 1945. So you'll see gentlemen with those types of souvenirs. I think we're about out of time. So we want to give you a little time to walk around the room and uh, work on your assignment. And if you have any questions, uh, just give Jonathan the